2 Samuel chapter 4, and we're going to begin with verse 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame on his feet, or lame of his feet. And he was five years old when the tidings came that Saul and Jonathan, uh, and the tidings came of, jo of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we ask that you would just open up our eyes to see, give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. Lord God, we ask, Lord God, for direction and for guidance. We thank you in advance for victory, for deliverance, Lord God, for your word to come forth. We thank you for transformation and change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Today, today's message, I will be preaching on crippled by the fall. Crippled by the fall. So... <clears throat> That, that is the title that the Lord gave me a long time ago, Crippled by the Fallen. And this story, Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan. If y'all will remember, Jonathan was King Saul's son and he was David's best friend. They were so close that, that, that he said that it surpassed the love of, of, a, of a woman. He, they were just they were BFF, best friend, you know. And... When the news came that Saul and Jonathan had died, the nurse that was taking care of Mephibosheth picks him up at five years old and begins to run. And in, in, in that haste, the Bible says, and in running, she fell. And because of that fall, Mephibosheth was, was crippled. Now, many t so, so back in that day, so you understand why she was running... A lot of times when there was a change in regime, a change of king, especially not in the same line or the same family, they, the other king, the new king would go and find all the lineage of the old king and kill him. So that there would be no question of, of whose authority was there or, or there would be no rebellion that pops up. They would go and wipe out that family. And so this is what's going on when this nurse gets up and, and begins to run. And she falls and hurts Mephibosheth and he was crippled by the fall. Now, I'm sure that you already hear it crippled by the fall because we are also crippled by the fall. Amen. There was a fall that happened back in Genesis and we're going to read about it in Romans chapter 5. If you'll go with me in Romans Chapter 5 and verse 12. I just want to read you a few scriptures because I want you to understand the state you were born into. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed on. You know what? I'm, I'm going to switch this to the Amplified. I want you to hear a, a little bit more expounded version. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all people, no one being able to stop it or escape its power because they all sinned. Sin was committed into this world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone when there was no law against it. Yet, death ruled over mankind. From Moses to Adam, the lawgiver, even, those, even over those who had not sinned as Adam did, Adam is a type of him, a type of Christ who was to come. But in reverse, Adam brought destruction but Christ brought salvation. And so I'm reading you this scripture and, and the title of today's message is Crippled by the Fall because, because of this fall of Adam, because he gave in to sin, because of his disobedience to the Lord, sin came into the world 
And because of that fall, sin cripples us. Sin brings death, amen? Sin, you, you read it right there, it brings death, it brings destruction. The Bible said the wages of sin are death. And we were all born into it and we've all come short of the glory of God because we have all sinned. But I want to talk a little bit about the things that cripple you this morning. See, going all the way back to Adam, that is a generational crippling. Okay? But, I, but not only back to Adam, because yes, we all fell into sin because of that. And, and, and we, you know, if you want to point blame at somebody, Adam and Eve, you know, you can point blame there. But there are other things that cripple you in your immediate lineage. You know what I'm talking about? We call them generational curses. Amen. Addictions many times are, are generational. Works of the flesh many times are, are generational. Mental battles that you fight many times are generational. All types of sins that you have to go through. Guess what? You got it from your mama or, or your daddy. Right? So, so, something, whatever, sometimes, have, have you ever looked at yourself the way you reacted and you, you responded just like your mom used to? And it's not a good thing. Right? Or you reacted or you fell into the same problems that dad did. Or you fell into the same problems that mama did. That will happen if that, if, if, if that generational curse, if that thing is not broken, that those things will follow you. Amen? It's generational. And make no mistake about it, all these things cripple you. But, but for some people, all those generational things, they crippled them at one time. And for some, they still cripple you. And you're like, I'm not crippled. You know, don't get offended. Listen. Listen, because I want you to be free. My, my, heart's, my heart's goal this morning, and I believe what the Lord wants this morning, is for you to realize that some of you are still crippled by the fall. Some of you are still crippled by what Adam did because we're, 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 we're tied into sin. And some of, you, some of us are still crippled by generational things because we're still tied into that. It hasn't been broken. For some reason, we're still holding on. We're still holding on to it. Amen. Some of us are still falling. See, we were crippled by the fall back then, past tense. Crippled by mama and daddy's fall, past tense. But some of us are crippled by the fall today. Because of what we do today. Because of what we thought of today. What we did today. How we spoke today. How we... Y'all feel me? Some of us are crippled by our current falling. That generational habit is crippling. That, you know, that, that, that attitude that mama had. Did you know it's crippling too? That habit was crippling. That anger issue, it's crippling. That offense issue is crippling. That I impatient issue is crippling. Your mindsets are crippling, church. That jealousy issue is crippling. That unforgiving, holding on to grudges issue, that's crippling. That pride issue, that's crippling, church. It's all a hindrance. It's all a restraint. It all immobilizes you. It all cripples you. Like I said, we're crippled sometimes by the fall. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with such a great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and sin that so do easily beset us and what that scripture means is there are some things that are crippling us that are hindering us that are weighing us down that we have to set aside and and the bible doesn't say that he's going to rip it from you he says you have to lay it down you have to set it aside you're the one who's going to have to drop it Amen. And it says it so easily besets us. It so easily hinders us. It so easily weighs us down. It so easily cripples us. 
And then I'll continue the scripture so that you know what it's crippling you from. So it says, let, let us therefore run with patience the race that is set before us. So in that race, in that walk with God, those things that we're still generationally dealing with are crippling us from running that race. And some people, so you were crippled by Adam's fall and, and, and you were crippled by generational curses and generational issues. And some people were crippled by someone else's fall. See, in the story of Mephibosheth, he was crippled, but it wasn't his fault. See, when the, the news came that Saul and Jonathan had died, his nurse picked him up and began to run and fell. And she fell. But Mephibosheth was the one who got crippled. It was her fault. It was her failure. It was her, the one who stumbled. But the person who got crippled was Mephibosheth. See, sometimes it's not so much the injury that cripples you. Sometimes it's that you didn't heal properly. Let me say that again, church. I think it went over your head. Sometimes somebody else's failure, somebody else dropped you, somebody else hurt you, somebody else fell on you, and you got injured, you got hurt, something happened. But you didn't heal properly is why you're still crippled. See, you can break an arm and if they set it right and they put a cast on it and they fix it, it will heal properly. And you can use that thing again. It won't cripple you. It won't bother you for the rest of your life. But if you leave that thing broken, if you leave that thing unset, if you leave that thing out of alignment, if you leave whatever you have, have broken off joint... You'll be crippled for the rest of your life. And some of us have been hurt by someone else. There was an abandonment issue. Some trauma happened. Some abuse happened. Some rejection happened. Some abandonment. Some attack. Something happened in your life way back when somebody else failed you. Your loved one, your father, your uncle, your daddy, your wife, your husband. Someone else failed you. And, and, and you're now crippled. Because they fell. Because of their failure. It wasn't Mephibosheth's fault. It was the nurse who was carrying him. Some people were, were supposed to be your, your help. She was a nurse. She was a servant that was supposed to help take care of them. There's some people in your life that should have been there for you. There's some people in your life that should have, should have been the right fathers. That should have been the right husbands. That should have been the right wives. That should have been the right mothers. But they weren't. And because of their failure and because of their fall, you're crippled because you never healed properly. You dealt with it the best you could, but you healed broken. You healed out of place. You healed crooked. You know what I'm talking about? That abuse that happened to you wasn't your fault. That trauma that happened to you, church, it wasn't your fault. The people that rejected you, it wasn't your fault. That person that abandoned you, it wasn't your fault. That attack that these people just jumped on you or whatever happened to you, it wasn't your fault. But it still injured you. It still hurt. It still affected you. And because you didn't heal correctly, you're still walking with a limp. You're still crippled to an extent. You're hurt and you remain crippled because you didn't heal properly. Let me, let me give a little bit more clarification. Your actions, your mindsets, your communication, your interpretation of what, what's going on around you, your responses, even your gifts and callings, all is coming from a place of woundedness because you're still broken. Because you didn't heal properly. Let me, let me say that again. Your actions, how you respond, you're still responding out of a place where of somebody that got broken, of somebody that got hurt, of somebody that got abused, of somebody that got... You, you, you hear, you're hearing. Your mindset, the way you think, the way you overcome. Well, I've got to be mean. 
to get my point across. I got to be loud so that people can hear me, right? I got to be ugly so people don't mess with me. I got to have my defense up all the time because they hurt me back then and I'm never, ever, ever going to let somebody into my heart. Y'all hear me? Some people don't let people into their heart. They don't even let God into their heart because they were hurt way back when and they're crippled by the fall. They're crippled by somebody else's action, somebody else's pain, somebody else's failure. You're crippled. And it's all, everything, even your gifts and callings can come from a place of brokenness and woundedness because you didn't heal properly. So when you minister and when you use your gift and when you walk in your calling, when you don't heal properly, it's tainted. It comes from a, from a place that's a little bit crooked. It's not completely lined up with the Word of God. It's not completely lined up in the things of God because you didn't heal properly. You're still crippled by the fall. I'm not saying you're not walking your walk. I'm not saying you're not trying. But something is off in your walk. Because you still have issues from when somebody else dropped you. Has anybody ever been dropped by somebody? Not literally. I mean, you know, sorry, son. I think we dropped him a couple of times. He came out all right. He got no limbs. But have you ever been dropped by somebody? Have you ever, uh, someone else failed you when they should have been there? You know, as, some, as a person that has, that has gone through um, abuse in their childhood, you can look at people that should have been there and be like, man, you should have been there. That should have never happened. You weren't there. You didn't ask for that abuse and it still happened and it still broke you and it still crippled you. You didn't ask for that person to abuse you. You didn't ask for that person to mistreat you. You didn't ask for that person to verbally abuse you or physically abuse you. You didn't ask for that person to leave you and abandon you. You didn't ask for any of this to happen, but it still happens. And if you don't heal properly, you're going to walk crippled. Even if you're walking in Christ, you're still going to walk a little off because... You're not letting it set properly. You need to get aligned. You need to get it set in the things of God so that you're not walking crippled. So you're not crippled by the fall. You can be hurt and heal. Or you can be hurt and stay crippled. You're still functioning, church. You're still walking. You're still, you're still called. You're still this. You're still a prophet. You're still a pastor. You're still a priest. You, whatever you want to call it, you're still a teacher. You're, you're still all these different things, but you're still wounded. You're still crippled. There's so many people walking in their call. So many people behind pulpits today. There's so many people that are relating to one another. And they're still broken they're still crippled they're still guarded because of what happened amen now some of us are crippled by fear another thing about the situation if you read the story is it's funny because Mephibosheth never should have been crippled nobody was chasing them David was not a, a, a vengeful man. He was, Mephibosheth's father was his best friend. Think about this for a second. All right, the nurse who was taking care of him, King Saul and Jonathan die. You look at King David, he's not a vengeful man. He doesn't, he didn't, he, he didn't even at times have, had the ability to kill King Saul and still didn't do it because he wanted to remain loyal and faithful. But yet, something made this nurse afraid. Something gave her fear, a vain imagination. It wasn't even true. It wasn't even there. And she ran. And because she ran from nothing, she still fell and, and crippled. Some of us, church, are being crippled by fear and no one's chasing you. You're being crippled by by vain imaginations. Amen. 
See, the, the Bible says that you've got to bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. That, rem- that means when you have a thought, something rises up in you, and it doesn't match the things of God. I always go to these, these little bitty things, you know, because I've seen them in the church, and, you know, I, I, I don't think brother so-and-so likes me very much. Every time I see him, he never smiles. Right? So then you get a vain imagination and you get a thought. Something could happen, church. And, 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 or something doesn't even happen. It's just simply a thought. It's a vain imagination. Something's going on around you and you believe when there's nothing there. Did it ever happen to you? You thought somebody was upset with you? You thought somebody was frustrated with you? You thought somebody didn't like you? And it was all a vain imagination. You know how many of that times that happens to me? I thought you were upset. No, that's just the way I look. I'm sorry. I make faces from here all the time and they're not aimed at anybody, I promise you. I don't even, I wish I could have a mirror and be like, oh, stop doing that, you look messed up. But there are times, church, that the enemy will use fear Fear of the unknown, fear of something that's not even going on, fear of things around you, and they're not real. It's just something he puts in your head to mess with you, to get you to run when no one's chasing you. To get you to be afraid when there's nothing there. Have you ever been in your house and you hear a noise? And, right? Immediately you hear the water bottle pops in the middle of the night, and you're like, get behind me, Satan. Right? <laughs> Satan wasn't even there. There were no witches there. A water bottle popped. And you're scared, right? The enemy will try to use fear any way he can, church. And a lot of times that fear is what's caused, it's what's crippling you. She ran when no one was chasing her. There was no reason to run. David was never after the line of Saul or the line of of Jonathan. He was never after wiping out that lineage. She was running for no reason. She was crippled by fear. No one's chasing. Are you running when no one's chasing you? Are, getting, are you getting offended when no one's trying to hurt your feelings? Are you, are you distancing yourself? Because I don't think anybody likes me, so let me just become a hermit. I'm going to become a holy hermit. At least I'll be holy. Come on. Right? There's some people that become holy hermits. I'm just going to be me and my Jesus and my Bible, and I'm never going to see anybody. How are you going to spread the gospel? How are you going going to be a witness? How are you going to give your testimony? How are you going to lay hands on the sick? How are you going to cast out devils if all you are is a holy hermit? God's not called us to that. God's called us to, to run a race. And there's some things that so easily cripple us and so easily beset us and so easily weigh us down. And some of it sometimes is fear. Are you crippled this morning by fear, church? We're crippled by the fall where fear is crippling. How many, don't raise your hand and don't claim it, but how many of you have anxiety issues? You're always stressed out. So so overwhelmed. It's fear. And, And how many know that that could be crippling? If you've ever gone through that, anybody, if you've ever had an anxiety attack, you can't move, you can't breathe, you can't talk, you just want to be all by yourself. It's crippling, church. It will keep you from fulfilling your purpose. Anxiety. And a lot of times, it's not real. I remember a long time, years and years ago, they came up with an acronym for fear, and it was false evidence appearing real. It's not real. It's just false evidence appearing real. That was the acronym that somebody gave me. Did you know in the Bible, 365 times it says, do not fear? That's one for every day of the week, all your life. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Why? Because it's so crippling, church. Have you ever seen those goats that when you scare them, they just, and they get hard and they just, they, they tense up and, and they look dead for a second until they shake out of it. There are some people in the body of Christ this morning that, that some little bitty thing comes and fear or anxiety or stress or some unknown thing comes and all of a sudden they're like, eh. 
Man, can you imagine if that happened in church? And, and, and man, oh, you're dealing with fear. Oh, there's 10 people dealing with fear. All of a sudden you walk by somebody. Eh. <laughs> right? Sometimes we wish that that might happen. Okay, let me, okay, you're dealing with fear too. Uh, see, see, you can continue dealing with fear or you can take it to the king. You can continue dealing with fear or you can get delivered. You can continue allowing fear to run your life. Or you can be set free. But church, so many people don't want to admit, oh, I'm afraid. Especially men. Let me go ahead and tell you, I was afraid of the dark. Right? I didn't like, mm -mm. even in the same room with my little brother, it was dark. I, I, I didn't like the dark. I didn't like it. Why? I don't know. I don't remember the trauma that messed me up, that crippled me in fear. But something, something messed me up. And I was crippled for a very long time of fear. Walking into a place, what if they don't like me? I was crippled by rejection as I got rejected a lot when I was little. I was crippled by trusting people because the people that I should have trusted mishandled me and abused me and mistreated me and I, I, I didn't trust people. My heart was guarded and I didn't want to open up to anyone so I just was tough. And was known as the tough person and the guy that everybody come to when they had a problem. Why? Because I had to be tough so that I didn't get hurt again. All the time knowing that I was crippled and didn't know it. That my hard heart was crippling me and I didn't know it. I had to get to a place where I got on my knees and let all that hardness fall off my heart for God to enter in because I kept him out for so long. Why? Because I was crippled by the fall, by my own fall, by my generational falls, by somebody else's failure. All these falls in my life kept crippling me. And some of the things when I healed, I healed crooked because it didn't get set right. I didn't heal right. Y'all know what I'm talking about this morning, church. Your fear, what makes you anxious, the unknown, the what if, your imagination, the thought, church. Some of us are, how many of you are afraid of tomorrow? What if? Why, what if I lose my job? I remember somebody told me along, what if you get fired? I'm like, well, I was looking for a job when I found this one. Amen. Like, I just go look for another one. And guess what I'll do? I'll find another, you know. I mean, some people, the what ifs, they got them paralyzed. They, you know what, maybe I should try a business, but what if it fails? God is like, I got you, go start it. I'm opening doors that you don't even know. And you're like, I can't. I got security. That steady paycheck is awesome. Trust me, I've been there. The what ifs. We like have some people paralyzed. The unknown. I, I, I'm going to say this because fear and the unknown come together in this. If, if you, the Bible says if you have a, an offering, if you have a gift, leave it at the, at the altar. If you remember that your brother has something against you or you have something against your brother, leave your gift at the altar and go fix that first. Even if you're not sure. The brother Adrian has something against me. I'm like, brother, man, you've been acting a little funny. Or I've been taking it funny. I don't know which one it is. But is, is, is something wrong? Did I hurt you? Because if I did, I'm sorry. I don't want there to be anything in between us. I love you. And if I did something, say it. Say it to my face. I need to know. I don't want to do it again. Instead of, well, whatever then. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Well, let be that way. You know, yeah, anybody? No. Be that way there. Yeah, I said that. Well, be that way there. I remember, I'll remember that. There's no reconciliation there. There's no healing there. There's no forgiveness there. All there is is you stuck in bitterness and crippled by the fall. That's all there is, church. And the enemy uses that every single day inside the church. Oh, I think so-and-so has something against me. Fear of the unknown, the what if. What if I go to them and I apologize and they just... Throw it in my face. Well, I didn't like you anyway. 
That's their problem. You, we have a responsibility to come and do what the Lord said regardless of somebody else's response. He doesn't say, go to your brother only if he looks like he's sorry too. It doesn't say that in the word. It says, go, apologize, go and reconcile, go and make sure, go into them. And then once you've got all that settled, then come and bring your gift. That's when you can offer to the Lord. That's when it's not tainted. That's when you're not offering up something that's mixed with something else. The enemy is using fear to cripple you, to immobilize you, church. We were crippled by the fall from Adam until now. We are like Mephibosheth. And like him, church, we don't have to stay there. Go to 2 Samuel. And this may be a heavy word this morning, but I've got some good news for you, church. 2 Samuel chapter 9. In verse 1. And King David's here. And Mephibosheth is in a place called Lodabar. And I'll get into that. But it says in uh, 2 Samuel 9 verse 1 says, And David said, Is there any yet left of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness, the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Am Amaliel, A Amiel, in Lodibar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar and the son of Amiel from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. What did he say? Fear not, for I will show thee kindness for, thy, for Jonathan thy father's sake, and I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat the bread of my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Verse 11. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded to his servant, so shall thy servant do. And as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Church, I wanted to read all that scripture because I wanted you to see that David never had a vengeful bone in his body toward the, for, toward the lineage of Saul. And I wanted y'all to know that, 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 that what I said, that some of you are running from when nobody is chasing you. This is, this, is, this is what's true. The king never had any issue and never was chasing. There's some people that believe God has it out for them. I'm going through so much, God must not like me. He has it out for me. There's nobody, nobody chasing you. King looked for, for Mephibosheth and he found him in Lodibar, a place called Lodibar. Lodibar means no pasture, no word. And no pasture means no field. No pasture means no produce. No pasture means no growth. That's where Mephibosheth was found. See, you're still dealing with the same issues from last year. When you're in Lodibar, like Mephibosheth was, you, you don't have any growth. 
You're still dealing with the same cycle. You're still going with, through the same things. You're still dealing with the same problems, the same issues, the same frustrations, the same works of the flesh, the same ones over and over and over because there's no pasture. Loaded bar means no pasture, no field, no growth, no produce. Some of us may be dealing with the same thing we did last year. If you really are still stuck in Lodabar, maybe you're dealing with the same thing from five years ago, 10 years ago. There's so many people that are dealing with stuff from their childhood because they're stuck in Lodabar. They're stuck in a place where there's no growth and no word, no pasture. And another meaning was no word, a barren and desolate place, a place where there's nothing, church. See, he was still in Lodibar, but, but he, he's there in that condition. But I want, you to, I want you to realize something, church. There are some people stuck in Lodibar this morning. They're stuck in a barren place. They're stuck in a place with no word. They're stuck in a place where they're in a continual cycle, doing the same thing over and over and again and never getting victory. There's somebody stuck there, but guess what's happening that you don't know about? The same time he was in Lodabar going through all that, being crippled and being in somebody's house and, and, and still on the run, there was a conversation happening that he didn't know about. There was a conversation happening that the king said, is there somebody that I can bless? Is there somebody in this household that I could bless? I want to be a blessing to the lineage of my best friend, Jonathan. Is there somebody still alive that I can bless? See, sometimes, church, when you're going through what you're going through, what ends up happening is you don't realize you're in the middle of your mess and there's a conversation happening somewhere about you. Somewhere about you to bless you. Somewhere to, uh, about you to lift you up. Somewhere about you to strengthen you. Somewhere about you something is happening and you don't even know about it. Mephibosheth was in Lodabar in a place, a barren place. And some of us are there. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. But there's conversations happening about you. There's some people that have lost their job. And you don't even know that people are talking about you. Remember that guy? That worked at that place. Man, he was a good employee. Let's go get him. Remember that one person? Remember that? that there, there are people coming from your past from years ago. Hey, you wouldn't happen to be looking for a job. Mm -hmm. I remember when I got this pulpit. Hey, you don't happen to know anybody that needs a pulpit? In the same time, I was praying, Lord, I would like a pulpit. <laughs> I don't have the money for it, but I would like a pulpit. And you know what? If it's not too much trouble, I would like for it to be steel and have these little designs. I can, I can, I can detail with God. And this guy goes, hey, would you like a pulpit? And I was like, do you have a picture? And he sends a picture. I was like, that's my pulpit. <laughs> and I said, how much? And he says, it's God's. Come get it. It's yours. You ain't got to pay for it. See, there was conversations happening behind the scenes. And when, when we were starting Activate Church that I didn't know about, I was like, Lord, how am I going to take it? I don't, you know, I don't have that much savings. And that, that, that pulpit online cost over 300 bucks. And I went, that's a pinch of pennies right now. And, and then, you know, I'm like, cool, all right, awesome. All right, now we need to find a place, and when we find a place, we're going to need chairs, and then get a message. Hey, you know, why do you need some chairs? <laughs> Come on. Woo! Right? I'm like, how much? I've been looking online. Before this text, I've been looking online. There were $50, $60 a chair. I was like, <laughs> Lord, you have to send somebody with a check. He says, I'll do you better. I'm going to give somebody to give you a whole 160 something chairs for free. You're not going to have a garage for a while, but you got some chairs. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. The church, the Lord, you know, we're already here, so I sure do wish I had a baptismal. Hey, you know anybody needs a baptismal? Well, I think it was about four or five thousand dollars baptismal thing. 
Come on. I don't show you that one's not free. Man, I, I told you before. It's the Lord's. Go get it. I'm telling you, church. There are some people that you, you don't, I don't know how I'm going to do it, Lord. I obey you. Yes, I'll say yes. I'll pass you. You know, activate church. Yeah, okay, we'll call it that. All right, what else? But I don't have this. I don't have that. I got you. There's conversations happening that you don't even know about. And you're going to get a call. You're going to get a text. You're, church, this, this doesn't have to happen to me, church. Some of us out there, there's some people out there that got blessed when they weren't expecting it. That, amen. Amen. amen? Man, I sure wish I had some grass. Hey, brother. We got some sod over here. Bring it. It's the middle of the night. Bring it. I've heard y'all testimonies. There are conversations happening, and God's putting on somebody's heart to bless you, and you don't even know it. And you're guess what? You're still in that barren place, and you're still crippled, and you're still hurt, and you're still broken. But God's having a conversation about you. There are conversations happening right now that you don't know about. Things are about to change in your life and you don't even know it. Amen. Some of you, there's a there's a wife going, man, I sure wish I had a man of God. It's just so loving. Somebody that could give really good hugs. <laughs> Amen. There's somebody, there's somebody praying. Did you know that they were praying for you? Come on, sure. I'm, I'm not playing. I, I know I'm messing with my brother over here, but but I'm not. There, there is somebody praying for a man of God and a woman of God, and 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 you didn't know that, but God was like, I got them. I've been preparing them, and they're getting healed. They were crippled, but they're getting set free, and they all these chains are breaking off of them. And I'm just setting them up right for you. I know you were mistreated, but I got the right one for you. I know that you were hurt, but I got the right one for you. I know that that one wasn't healthy, but I got the right one for you. There's some conversations happening you don't even know about. Somebody's praying, and the Lord goes, I got you. By the way, you got to go to Activate Church to find out. So if you're online, you got to come here to find out. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Shameless plug. I'm just saying. The circumstances are about to change, and you don't even know it. You know why? Because the king is calling you. He's calling for you. You're about to transition from Lodi Bar to the palace. You're about to transition from begging for food to being sitting at the king's table. You're about to transition from living paycheck to paycheck to being blessed with abundance and overflow where you're blessing other people. You're about to transition, church, from being the borrower to being the lender. You're about to transition from being the tail to being the head, and you don't even know it. The king is calling. He said, well, there's got to be some. See, the Bible says that he looks to and fro throughout the earth, looking for somebody who he can show himself strong through. God's been looking for you. Now, you just need to poke your head out. Who, me? Right? right? It's like somebody saying, hey, I'm not sure who needs to be blessed, but I inherited this money. You're like, <laughs> imagine somebody to some billionaire coming out that I'm not sure who needs this but I was just blessed with this money and I don't need all that work. God's going I'm not sure who needs a blessing he's looking at you waiting for you to go yeah. open it up flood it I want to drink through a fire hose. I want it all I want it all amen the king is calling for you. You're about to transition from Logan Bar to a place of favor, church. He's about to he's about to sit you at the king's table as one of the king's sons. He's about to restore everything that you lost, everything that your daddy lost, everything your grandpa lost because he was after the wrong person. He's about all the mistakes that your generation made and where you could have been. He's about to restore everything that you lost and you don't even know it. You're still in the Logan Bar. He's going to restore everything and more, church. And here's the cool thing about it is the king said, I'm going to send, he calls somebody and he calls his servants. He says, here's what I need you to do. Go restore all his land. And then 
Well, he's crippled, so he can't. He doesn't even have the. He's been crippled since he's five, so he doesn't know how to farm. He doesn't know how to harvest. And you know what? Just go ahead and work the land for him. Make sure that he's he's blessed. Y'all work for him. Oh. Right? He's the king sends his servants to go work the land for him. He says, by the way, uh, you're going to do a work on all that land. It says so he could have food, but he really doesn't need it because he's going to be eating at my table. Where there's an abundance. He's going to be eating at my table where the food never runs out. He's going to be eating at my table where it's favor after favor. He's going to be sitting on a chair. And guess what? At the king's table, you can't even tell. It's crippled. You can't even tell he has any issues with his feet. You can't even tell that he was wounded once ago. You can't even tell that he was hurt. Have you ever looked at somebody that, that used to be this BC and now you look at them and they're like, you don't even look the same. That's because they've been sitting at the king's table. They've been sitting at the king's table so long, they don't even see, they don't even reflect that old crippled state. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So, I, I, don't, I don't think you realize, see, see you, you, he sent his helpers to strengthen you, and God is having conversations with angels. His servants. And he says, see Sister so and so. Yeah, she's a lower bar. Go take that blessing to her. That prayer, that aunt, that prayer that she's been at. Go answer that prayer. Go strengthen her. Go go lift her up. Go go remove that obstacle. Go remove that obstacle. Hallelujah. Just take take that pain away. Take that sadness away. Take that depression away. And he's sending his servants right now after you, church. You have no idea. There are, there are angels chasing after you to bless you because the Lord said so. Because a conversation happened when you were at your lowest point. And you didn't even know it. Can, can you receive that? Can you receive that the Lord wants to bless you? Come on, I, I, I think we need to give him just a few moments of, of high praise. A few moments of giving him everything that we've got. Because we know that we're about to sit at the king's table. God is calling you out of Lodabar to a place of favor. And we're acting like we're still in a place of Come on, you ain't crippled anymore. God has healed some of you. God has broken some of the things off of you. And you don't even realize that God is telling you. Is he, is he worth a little bit of praise? Isn't he worth a little bit of worship? Isn't he worth saying thank you, God? Come on, church. We've, we've come out of these places. King David brought Mephibosheth from that place to the king's table where all his needs were met. And the land that he lost was restored. And he said, from now on, you're going to eat at my table like one of the king's sons. He was crippled by the fall, church. But once the king restored him, what, what was crippling him and what once crippled him was made of no effect. Well, I'm crippled, so I can't. There was one person that was crippled for, for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda. And he says, I have no one to put me in the water. The one the waters are stirred up to get my miracle. And Jesus says, I didn't ask you if you needed to get the water. I asked you if you wanted to be made whole. And the Lord's asking for everyone in this place if you want, if you're crippled right now, if there's something crippling you right now, and you want to be made whole, all you have to answer is one question. Do you want to be made whole? Yes. And he's telling you this morning, get up, take that bed up, and walk. Walk out of here. Leave that crippled mess there. Leave that brokenness there. Leave that pain there. Leave that injury there. Leave that offense there. Leave everything that's got you way down there. And take up your bed and walk. Because I'm going to heal you. You don't need any stirring up. See, church. We can be crippled. We can be broken. We have could be the, the person that, that was was not healed correctly. And what you don't realize that this morning, right now, the reason why I'm preaching this message instead of two years ago when he gave me the title is because he said there's some people here that need to hear. They didn't realize that they were still crippled. They didn't realize that they were still hindered. They didn't realize that they still had a burden. He goes, but I'm here to heal them this morning. I'm here to tell them to take up thy bed and walk. I'm here to, to remove every obstacle, every chain, every weight, every, every generational curse, every, every problem from somebody else. 
saying, I know that you were crippled by the fall, but I'm going to heal you. Jesus is saying, I know you were crippled by your lineage, but I'm going to deliver you. I know you were crippled by someone else, but I'm going to heal you. I know you were crippled by the fall, but I came to save you. I know that you were crippled and you lost a lot, but I came to restore everything that you lost, church. And I know that you were crippled and you didn't heal properly. But I'm going to make you a new creation. I'm going to make you brand new. So not only do you not have to heal correctly now, because I'm going to, I'm going to take everything that you were and I'm going to bury it. And I'm going to raise you in newness of life. And behold, all things have become brand new. You've been restored. You've been redeemed. You've been set free, church. And if you don't know it, I'm here to tell you that Jesus came and he died to take away the sins of the world. That whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That, that curse of the fall, that curse of of sin, that wage of sin is death. And Jesus said, if you just believe on me, you don't have to worry about the curse of, of death because you're going to have everlasting life. Amen. And if you, if you haven't felt his tug this morning, the king is calling you and all you have to do is answer the call. Or you can stay in your condition. You can stay in Lodabar. It's your choice, church. When the king comes calling, you can either stay where you're at or you can come like verse 6 in 2 Samuel 9 and he says that Mephibosheth came. He says, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. See, you can either continue running or you can come before the king this morning, fall on your face and give him reverence. And say, I'm at your mercy, whatever you want to do. Amen. And all the king has for you is no malice. All he has for you is blessing. All he has for you is restoration. All he has for you is for you to sit at the king's table like the son of the king and the, and the daughter of the king that you are. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came to save us. That we were crippled by the fall and crippled by what Adam did. But we came, Lord Jesus, knowing that you came and you died on a cross so that we could be redeemed. So that we could be restored. So that we could be forgiven. So that we could be made new, Father God. Lord Jesus, thank you for revealing the things that cripple us from our past and the things that cripple us today, Father. If there is anything in me, Lord God, any weight, any sin, anything that's crippling me, Father God, deliver me from it. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, I, I ask for forgiveness of every evil word I've ever said, every evil thought I've ever had, every evil thing that I've ever done, everything that I didn't do that I should have done. Father, forgive me. I don't want to be crippled anymore by my past or by the past of my fathers and my generations or even all the way back to Adam. Father, you've renewed me, you've restored me, you've redeemed me, and I receive my salvation. I receive forgiveness. I receive the blood from the cross. I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I receive it this morning. Feel me, Lord. Save me, God. Deliver me, O oh Lord. Cleanse and purify me. Wash me clean and make me new. Just continue to praise Him tonight, church, as we play a little bit of, of music. Just continue to worship. And if there's been anything that's been crippling you in your life, He said, set it down. Let Him lay aside every weight and every sin.